Today I will be speaking about brain function and dysfunction with an overall goal of providing the audience with some insights about which are the main operational principles of the brain. We are visual animals. It has been estimated that up to 70% of the brain is related to the processing of visual information. And well, the, the information coming from our visual field uh, once reach the retina is, you know, is, is going upstream to the visual cortex. And the way in which the visual cortex uh, works is a very good example uh, to illustrate a number of paradoxes of how the brain works both in normal conditions as well as in disease states. Voy a hacer la presentación en español, la charla va a ser en inglés, ¿no? Sí, 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 no, 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 sí, no hay ningún problema. Normalmente solo se hace de repente. Bueno. Eh, a ver, gracias por venir de nuevo. Hoy para mí, bueno, me siento muy contento de poder presentar a José Luis Lanciego. Creo que lo que os va a hablar os va a interesar bastante puesto que uno de los temas más importantes que hay actualmente y más de moda es la neurociencia. También la neurociencia computacional, pero bueno, la, la neurociencia es, eh, es clave. Que os va a hablar sobre el cerebro, etc. Bueno, deciros que es, eh, es investigador del programa de neurociencias dedicado pre, eh, preferencialmente al desarrollo de técnicas de terapia genética para el tratamiento de la enfermedad del Parkinson y otros procesos neurodegenerativos. Eh, como todos más o menos tenemos eh, familiares cercanos, pues eh, deciros que, que es bastante interesante. A ver, después, mira, la trayectoria profesional es licenciado en Medicina y Cirugía por la Universidad de Salamanca en junio del 90 y yo hice física en Salamanca. <risa> ya te lo dije, ¿no? Grado de Licenciatura en Medicina y Cirugía por la Universidad de Salamanca en septiembre del 90, doctor en Medicina y Cirugía. La Universidad de Salamanca también ha realizado estancias en la, eh, de investigación en la Universidad de Ámsterdam, Holanda, Reiche, Holanda, desde 1997 forma parte del CIMA en la Universidad de Navarra, Centro de Investigación Médica y Medicina Aplicada, profesor de Neurociencia en la Universidad de Navarra, investigador principal del Grupo de Enfermedades del Parkinson dentro del programa de Neurociencia. Bueno, <coughs> podría decir que tiene dos patentes, es cofundador y consultor de Health Therapeutics, eh, bueno, ha participado en más de 20 proyectos de investigación, siendo investigador principal en 18 de ellos, ha participado como CRO en varios contratos con empresas, etc. Las áreas de interés que más eh, eh, desarrolla es estudio de la neurobiología de la enfermedad del Parkinson, estudio de receptores acoplados a proteínas en el contexto de la enfermedad del Parkinson, estudios de circuitos cerebrales subyacentes sí, a la fisiología de la enfermedad del Parkinson y terapia genética en la enfermedad del Parkinson. Profesor de la Universidad de Derecho de Neurociencia, ha dirigido nueve tesis doctorales, cuatro de ellas con premio... Espera, perdona, luego ya... Que no se me pase, que te voy a pasar. Ha escrito tres libros, diez capítulos, por ente invitado en más de 15 cursos, ha participado en la publicación de 120 artículos de investigación en revistas internacionales y en más de 110 comunicaciones pues, en congresos. Podríamos seguir hablando, pues, eh, cuando quieras, José Luis, ya sabes que estas cosas hay que hacerlas. Ya, ya, ya. ya, ya. Bueno, eso bueno. sobre todo demuestra que somos buenos. <risa> eso es, vale. Bueno, thanks a lot. Eh, bueno. so, eh, you can start whenever you want. Buenas tardes, Arracha León, Gulatli, y Uh -huh. uh, thanks a lot uh, to Humberto uh, and to Haki Ude for the kindest invitation to be here speaking today. Uh, well, um, in order to understand, uh, we have to realize that today is Friday afternoon, so I don't want to be the typical boring guy speaking about too many things. <coughs> so the overall idea is to provide you with you know, some flavor about how the brain works. How the brain works both in normal conditions as well as in pathological conditions. Okay? So this is the overall idea. And on top of this, I want all of you to have some fun today. So I'm going to show you a number of examples and together with a number of exercises that you need to play. And you need to have you know, a very focused attention on what is on the screen at the given time in order to, uh, to get the most of this, uh, of this talk. Okay? So in order to think about the brain, the brain overall, 
uh, we have to realize that we are mainly, or by far, we are visual animals. So vision is our main sensory input. And the way in which the brain uh, deals with the visual information is very useful for here today uh, to give you some examples of paradoxes in an attempt to illustrate how the brain uh, processes uh, visual information. Okay? So, to get started, uh, some very basic information about the brain. Okay? So, you are very young, you probably never have a chance to watch a movie that is at the beginning of the 70s, made by Woody Allen, called The Sleeper. Okay? The Sleeper is a movie um, about a guy that has been frozen for 200 years. Okay? And at a given point, because they froze it, so this guy goes to a wall that 200 years later, he says, well, this guy is almost impossible to recognize anything. Okay, so this, you know, paves the ground for, you know, to, to spread on the typical paranoids of Woody Allen. And one of the classical paranoids of Woody Allen are psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. So he came to a psychiatrist to receive some treatment, and the first option for treatment, you know, for, for the guy was an electroshock. And he reacts against this, this, this treatment with a sentence that became very famous, one of the most classical ones in brain research, that said, don't touch my brain, it's my second favorite organ. <laughs> okay, so to me, mm -hmm. I, of course it's my first favorite organ for a number of things. Mm -hmm. So you need to know that the brain is not a big organ, it's, it represents about only 2% of the body weight. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have organs, much bigger, such as the liver, the gut, even the skin, yeah. and much bigger than the brain. However, mm -hmm. for the amount of energy you need in a daily basis, mm -hmm. the brain is about to consume 20% of your body energy. Mm -hmm. So information from the environment comes to the, to the brain mm -hmm. through the sensory organs. Mm -hmm. So it's information coming to the brain, the brain receives much more information that has been handled. The information is coming to the brain, and the brain you know, needs to process this information in a matter of milliseconds and to react accordingly. Okay? One thing I want to discuss with you later on is to what extent are we living in Matrix. Do you know the movies on Matrix, the three movies on Matrix? It's like a parallel world. Hmm? So, you know, I, I, I want you to think about to what extent uh, we are living in the real world or we are living in the matrix world. Okay. So the brain, you know, is, you know, has often been seen as a computer with a very impressive storage capacity, mm -hmm. three times the entire extent of Wikipedia or more than two million books. So it's quite a lot of information that we can store in our brain. Uh, you know, the, the surface of the brain is a thin area, I will show you in a minute, it's called the cerebral cortex. Mm -hmm. And the cerebral cortex is what really makes us human beings. Mm -hmm. All animals have brains, but because of the size of the cerebral cortex, the cerebral cortex is what really makes us a uh, human being. Mm -hmm. It has plenty of connections, mm -hmm. we will show you in a minute. Mm -hmm. Another thing I want you to think about is why the surface of the brain is so much uh, convoluted, is so much winter. Perhaps you never think about, but there is a good reason to have a convoluted brain. Okay, so, you know, the main challenge for, for this century we are all living in is to understand how the brain works. We know lots of things about the brain, but there are more unknowns than knowns. Okay? Yeah, and this is important. Mm -hmm. uh, the, main, the brain is made of water and fat. Mm -hmm. uh, 75% of the brain is water and fat. And fat is something we think about, you know, something we want to get rid of. Mm -hmm. But we need some fat in the brain, you know, to put the brain can work in, in the right way. Okay? So <coughs> the information mm -hmm. is quite simple. It's just electricity. So neurons communicate each other with electricity. Mm -hmm. and, and this is you know, how the brain works. It's uh, action potentials that are going from one neuron to another. It's just uh, electricity in motion. Mm -hmm. 
This is how the coin works. Okay? And this is a some examples. And if this is a, a mice, this is a cat, this is a monkey, and this is a human brain. Just to compare, it's, it's not in the same scale, this is much smaller than the, the, the that is represented here. But you can see that the, the brain surface mm -hmm. is very much convoluted, it's very much wrinkly okay, compared to any other animal species. And there's a whole reason for this. Mm -hmm. you know, during the evolution, in order to be, let's say, humans, mm -hmm. the brain grows and grows quite a lot. However, the brain is inside the school. Mm -hmm. So you, need, you have two main choices. Mm -hmm. In order to accommodate all this uh, mass of brain, you have two main choices. Uh, you can have a rather small head, and a small skull, and you need to bring everything just to be able to fit everything inside. <coughs> or, if you want to have a wonderful flat brain, you need some school of that size. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know, the evolution decides to have a, a head, let's say a regular size, and to bring the brain in order to be able to accommodate the brain in such a small school. Okay. So, and this is a brain. This is a, just a, a section of the human brain. <coughs> this is the spinal cord, the cerebellum, and this is the brain. The brain. And what is the surface of the brain is a little bit darker than the inside of the brain. This is called gray matter. And the gray matter <coughs> in the face is the cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex, as I mentioned before, is what will make us human beings. Uh, if we can just flatten the entire surface of the federal cortex, we will come up with a pizza of medium size. Mm -hmm. So the message here is that a pizza of medium size mm -hmm. is, what is, <coughs> is what is making us uh, humans. Okay? Well, so <coughs> it has been estimated that the brain is made of 100,000 million of neurons. It's hard to count so many neurons, it's just an estimation. But we know that on average, mm -hmm. each single neuron is receiving up to 7,000 connections. Mm -hmm. So you just put everything together, mm -hmm. and it's called the human connector. Mm -hmm. And it's just in case this can be just linearized, just put one connection after the other, mm -hmm. you end up with this distance, 150,000 kilometers mm -hmm. of connections in your brain. That all together represent four complete turns to the Earth, or just half the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So all these connections, very you know, well packed together, <coughs> is what you have inside each of your brain. And so there are plenty of connections over there. Okay, so as I mentioned before, you know, the brain receives information from our surrounding world through the sensory organs. And there's something you need to understand. Uh, sensory organs receive information so we can hear with the eyes, with ears, sorry, and we can see with our eyes, okay? But listening and watching is something that is done in the brain. It's not the same, okay? So listening and watching is the output of brain processing information. So the primary input is something we can see something we can hear, but at the end, mm -hmm. this is nothing without the brain. The brain is what is going to make the final picture of everything. How everything sounds like, how everything looks like. This is just the output of pure brain processing. Okay? And we are visual animals. <coughs> That's, this is a good reason. We are visual animals, which is why we have our eyes just in front of our head. There are some animals with the, uh, with the, with the eyes just lateral to the head. Okay? We have our eyes just in front because we are visual animals. Mm -hmm. And it has been estimated that 70% of the entire brain, the entire brain areas, uh, are related to some extent, more or less extent, to the processing of visual information. So that's why the vision uh, for us is absolutely important. Okay? Is everything clear so far? The, Okay, so to what extent are we living in Matrix? Of course, you need to be aware of what the, this movie means. But this is related to the way we feel, or the way we sense 
I was a running world. So as I mentioned before, information comes from the sensory organs. And this information is later on processed in the brain. And the brain is, at the end, what is going to give you an overall idea on how your surrounding looks like. So for instance, a good example is just colors. The colors are you know, something that doesn't really represent, uh, exist in the nature. So the, the feeling of colors, uh, what is green, what is red, this is coming out of brain processing. So the green really doesn't exist in nature, and the red doesn't exist neither. But, you know, uh, something that is you know, coming to the dinner as green or red mm, is what at the end of the, day, of the day, the brain will tell you what is green and what is red. And this is like just simply, you know, uh, information that are given uh, at a green, uh, at a green uh, longitude, what it means green versus what it means red. But this, for instance, you can see, for instance, a red tie. This is red, just simply because your brain is telling you that this is red. But it might not be red, it might be of a different color. But all your brains together are telling you that this is red instead of green. Do you understand what I mean? Okay. So, for this, you know, this is Morpheus, mm -hmm. he's one of the main star in these movies. Mm -hmm. He's the god associated uh, with the sleep and dreams. Mm -hmm. And he's speaking about the movie, what is real? Mm -hmm. To what extent we can be sure that something is real? Mm -hmm. How do you define real? So it's impossible to, it's like philosophy, but you know, one of the most difficult things is to elucidate what is real versus what is not real. And the only way you have to, de to decide what is real is what your brain tells about what is real. Okay, so may, it might be the case, I hope, no, but it might be the case that we are living just in a parallel world. So the only idea we have, you know, the, the only possible way we have to understand our surrounding world is you know, what the brain tells you about the surrounding world. But this must be, you know, just a sophisticated simulation. Mm -hmm. You don't have any chance to, to really make a decision of what is real and what is not real. Okay, so in terms of the visual information, <coughs> uh, well, the, you know, the, the visual field is reflected into the retina. The retina is a dark area, <coughs> you know, at the end of your eye. This is the retina. It's a very really small, yeah, thin layer of, of, of that over there. <coughs> so the 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 <coughs> sorry, the visual field goes to the retina in a two-dimensional way. So the retina only perceives the visual field in two dimensions. However, you know the brain can manage to give you some perspective. So information coming to the retina is bidimensional. However, the information once processing the brain <coughs> became 3D. Okay? So the, the third dimension is something that is added to the brain. It's added by the brain instead of the retina. The retina has no chance to see three dimensional. Okay? The, the third dimension is something that at the end is going to be added by the brain because the way in which the brain processes in visual information. Okay, understood? Good. So, let me see. With this image, I want to uh, explain mm -hmm. how you can change uh, perception, or to what extent your visual perception might be biased. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just a matter of the way in which you illuminate a given object. So, for instance, here you have a mountain of trash. Mm -hmm. And you can see, you know, this is just a pile, a mountain of <coughs> trash that for all of us, it just means trash. It doesn't mean anything else. Mm -hmm. However, it should change just the way in which the light illuminates this mountain of trash. Mm -hmm. For instance, if we are illuminating just from the front, you came up with a completely different perception. Mm -hmm. So now you can see <coughs> some shadows mm -hmm. projected into the posterior wall. You have one guy smoking here, maybe a lady, and drinking some wine. 
But the mountain of trust is exactly the same. The only thing that has changed is the way in which you illuminate this mountain of trust. Mm -hmm. So with this example, mm -hmm. what I want to illustrate here is that mm -hmm. the physical reality may change mm -hmm. the perception you're about to retrieve at the end. Okay? So never take anything for granted. No, your surrounding may change, but just simply the way in which you illuminate a given object. Okay? And I have, well, there are plenty of examples of this bias perception. Let me show you some more examples. Okay. Uh, once the information of a given object reaches your brain, the first thing <coughs> that the brain is about to do is to compare this information that is coming to the brain but what, with the information you have already stored in the brain, your visual memory. <coughs> mm -hmm. So all of us, in, by going through a number of experiences, uh, at the end we have in the brain a number of visual memories. So when some information is coming to the brain, the brain, in order to make a final you know, idea <coughs> of what are you looking at, the brain compares this information that is entering the brain with the information that is already stored in the brain. So let's take a look at this. Here you have a number of blue dots with some arrows. Okay? This, is only, this is the only thing that is in this image. Some blue dots and some arrows. Some of you, I hope most of you or all of you, can see a cube here, a white cube. But this is not true. This is, this is not a cube here. The, the cube is not drawn. This, this line just simply doesn't exist here, here, and here, and here. However, you can see, you can watch a cube because you have shown before a cube. So, so as long as you know how a cube looks like, this, is, you know, this feeling is stored in your brain as a visual memory. So every time you can see something similar to a cube, you can identify a cube just simply because you have see, you saw a cube before. So information is, you know, in, in the former uh, is not that the former experiences mm -hmm. allows you to make the final picture, allows you to hypothesize what are you watching. Mm -hmm. If you never saw a cube before, it's impossible to elucidate or to realize that there is a cube here. And indeed, there's not a single cube in the, in the, in the screen. Hmm? These are just this, this, this drawing just made of blue dots and uh, arrows. However, just simply because you saw a cube before, hmm, you can realize it might be some cube drawn in white in this image. Okay? So this is just to make you understandable uh, how we compare incoming information to what is already stored in our brain. Okay? So there are some few more examples here. <coughs> well, I don't know if you can see. Well, these are some images that are you know, very much pixelated. And sometimes, particularly here, it's, it's hard to recognize because of the, uh, the illumination. But perhaps you can identify for which movie is this coming from. Forest Camp. <laughs> Why do you know this is Forest Camp? Because you saw the movie before. Mm -hmm. so if you didn't show Forest Camp before, mm -hmm. and with this image, it would be impossible to ascertain yes. that this is Forest Camp. Seated mm -hmm. is speaking about the chocolate box. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the movie? But you, 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 my point is that you can identify Tom Hanks here uh, playing Forrest Gump just simply because you saw the movie before. And just in case you never watched the movie before, uh, it would be to be absolutely impossible to realize that this is uh, Tom Hanks uh, playing Forrest Gump. Uh, so your visual memory is working here to complete the picture. Uh, now perhaps the best way to, to so you this, mm? this, this took a couple of examples more. Mm? Uh, you have some screenshots for very famous movies mm? uh, uh, with a level of pixelation that is almost impossible to elucidate uh, from which movie is coming from. Okay? 
uh, you may have some chance to elucidate from which movie is coming this, but since you are very young guys, this is going to be a much more difficult job. Mm. That, did, well, did any of you know which movie is, is this big here? Just raise your hand, you can identify the movie. Not you, but you cannot participate. <laughs> okay, so let's try to make your life a little bit easier. This is Star Wars. Yes. <laughs> that, that's for sure. It was not that difficult. Okay? But this other one is a super classic movie. Mm -hmm. A great movie called The Great Dictator. Mm -hmm. It's on the screen in 1940, so well before you were born. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't show this movie before, this is Charles Chaplin. Mm -hmm. Bring a job for a great dictator and playing with the global, uh, with, with the globe. So it's a very famous movie, uh, very nice to watch. But you know, if you get started with this couple of pictures, uh, and yes, you have you watched before these movies, uh, it's impossible to elucidate uh, in what movie we are speaking about. Okay. So Star Wars. Okay, we are now all freaks, so it's quite easy to identify. But the great dictator is not that easy because you are very young guys. And you never have a chance before to watch this movie. Okay? So you don't have any formal information <coughs> about the great dictator is stored in your brain. So your brain just simply cannot deal with this incoming information in, in order to finally identify uh, from which movie we are talking about. Umberto and I, we can recognize the great dictator because we are a little bit older than you. Mm -hmm. But for you, this is going to be almost an impossible job. Okay? This is just to illustrate the importance of your storage uh, visual memory. Okay? Okay, so let's, let's have um, some more fun games. So, well, here you have a, a number of, you know, circles. Uh, because of the illumination, I'm not sure if you can see some blue. Uh, Two ones around, but just just get focus on the on the on the purple ones and the yellow ones. Okay. So well, I want you to focus your attention, and you need to pay attention. Just just focus your vision into the dark spot at the center of the of the screen, mm -hmm. and just don't don't move your eyes from there. Just focus your vision on the on the dark spot at the center. Mm -hmm. So if you fix your vision for a while here, there's something coming on. Mm -hmm. So what's happening? <coughs> is, there, is there anything about to change? Yes, you don't see the purple. Okay, so the, the, the other ones in color are about to disappear mm -hmm. over time. So the long you fix your vision on the central dark spot, you are about to lose visual perception for the periphery. Okay? This, this is what is happening in your brain. Yeah? But you know, I, I didn't change anything. You know? I, I can even, you know, just let the point there alone. Mm -hmm. And the effect is exactly the same. So the longer you focus your vision onto the dark central spot, you will see that, you know, the peripheral ones are about to disappear progressively. And there is a, let's say, a bi biological reason for this. And here, you can blame the retina. Mm. The retina is like, like, let's say, in order to make myself understandable to you. So just think about the retina like an, uh, an iPhone, OK? Mm -hmm. yeah, with a nice camera, plenty of megapixels, OK? So the retina is not constructed this way. The retina has a uh, small area in the center of the retina, called macula, that is a super iPhone with a super megapixel camera. Okay? So the maximum accuracy of vision is coming out for the information reaching the macula. This is a nice camera with wonderful amount of megapixels. However, the peripheral retina is like a very old phone like a Motorola, or well, we are very, very young to you know what is a Motorola, <coughs> right? But I can tell you, you know, at the beginning, you know, before the arrival of iPhones, you know, the cameras of the, of the, of the they, are, they are not even the smartphones at this stage. 
but the cameras from the first generation of uh, cellular phones uh, only contains a very tiny amount of megapixels. So the resolution is not the same. Resolution in the central retina is superb. However, resolution in the peripheral retina is not that good. And this is why, once you focus your vision in the dark central spot, you are about to lose information about what is going on in the periphery. This is the reason why uh, everything that is in your peripheral field of vision is about to disappear. Okay? So let's go to a few more examples. Another thing I want to stress is that the, um, how to explain, the sense of vision uh, and the final information is context dependent. It's not only about what are you watching, it's about what is all around what you are watching. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's in, the context is very important. So, for instance, you have some examples here. Hmm? You have some, you know, some dots in gray, in a, in a different gradient of gray, together with some boxes hmm, that are colored the opposite way, in a different gradient of gray. So, if I try to convince you that, for instance, this circle is of the same amount of gray that this other one, you will say, okay, this guy is crazy. Hmm? Uh, this is much darker than this other one. Mm -hmm. But this is not true. They are exactly the same, both. Mm -hmm. And what is changing your perception, your perception, the context is changing your perception. But I can give you my work. This vehicle is exactly the same one as this one in terms of gray intensity. And this is another example. The typical chess mm -hmm. table, where you have white and dark mm -hmm. squares. Okay, so what about if I try to convince you that this one that is labeled with an A, you can see the A here, mm -hmm. it's because of the illumination, but it doesn't matter. This is A and this is B. Mm -hmm. This is black and this is white. Okay? So how, to what extent I can convince you that this A square is of the same intensity as this B square? You perceive completely different. You say, okay, this is darker than this other one. But this might not be the case because it's context dependent. So if I just remove everything, I can give you my wall that I didn't change anything. This is the same square, and this is the same square as before. Now, without the context, your perception is that both look like the same. And this is just context dependent. Of course, I can be sure that I didn't convince you. So I have another exercise to prove that I am right on what I am explaining. So you can see here, and then we can remove it. So you can see that once the A is surrounded by three white ones, it looks darker, where the B one, that is the same as darker, was surrounded by black ones, looks not that much dark. And this is just an exercise in a video. So it's the same. So this one I gave is here, moving this square to this position. Uh, and this looks like white, but once moved to the other side, it looks darker. But it's exactly the same square. Mm -hmm. The only thing that changed is the context. Okay. So just think about how you sense the surrounding world. Is, uh, you know, every time you have a visual perception, this perception might be biased by the context. Again, okay? this is the very image. And now I have a very nice uh, fun exercise uh, with a number of Hollywood stars. So this is from Greece. Mm? This is the idea, I don't remember the name. But you have to focus your attention on two. Can you see some uh, points here? Mm -hmm. Just focus your attention here, where I have the point, okay? Just look at the center of the image. And you need to turn, just, just focus here. And you need to tell me <laughs> if there is anything that is about to change. Of course, you can move back to the lateral views and then go back again to the center. Is something happening there? 
Just think, just concentrate your vision here. <laughs> Is there anything changed? What's happening there? Just raise your hand and tell me what you can see. Hmm? Nothing happened? Yeah? The shape of the faces. The shape of faces moves to, let's say, a, a rotex appearance. Hmm? And this, is, once again, you can blame your retina. It's another exercise explaining the difference between central vision and peripheral vision. So, as long as you concentrate your visual field, you focus your attention on the center of your visual field, you are about to lose information about the periphery. That's why you can see you know, the lateral images, you can see like a, a cartoon instead of real pictures. Okay? Good. Okay, so let's move into brain dysfunction. So once your brain is no longer in a healthy situation, how is it going to change your visual perception and to what extent? And I have a couple of examples here. This is a painter that, you know, his main interest was to paint cats. So this is the typical painting of this guy. This is a cat. However, this guy, it's hard to see here, this guy starts to suffer from a brain disorder called schizophrenia. It's a progressive disorder. So he is still painting cats, but as the disease goes on, you can see that the, because of the disease, the brain is about to change the way this guy uh, perceives the cats. So, you know, if you, you know, go from here to here to here to here, you can really feel disease progression. So, for instance, if at this stage, it is hard to recognize, to be recognized as a cat, but if you talk to the patient at this stage, <laughs> he is going to be 100% sure that what he is painting is just a real cat. So he, just, he was here just watching a cat, and he is just painting what he is watching to. But because of the brain disorder, the way in which the brain perceives the cat is the cat. <coughs> okay? But it's the same cat. But you know, the, the perception is distorted by the disorder. And this is another typical example. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a patient, mm -hmm. and because of the, the disease he's suffering, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's about to change the way in which the brain perceives the world because of a given brain disorder. Uh, so these are three typical drawings that neurologists really like it. You know, every time you go to the neurology, you just start drawing something. So this is just a watch, house, and flower. So this patient is suffering from a stroke on one side of the brain. So one side of the brain is no longer functioning well, and the other side of the brain is in perfect shape. So he was asked to reproduce, to replicate this drawing in this piece of paper. As you can see, because of half of the brain is being damaged, he only perceived in half of the, of the, of the information. Mm. So, so, you know, he, he can just, he, but if you talk to the patient, he can be 100% sure that he's doing a perfect drawing. However, the brain, because of the vision, is about to neglect half of the visual field. Okay? And this is the typical drawing okay, for a patient trying to reproduce this drawing for a patient suffering from a stroke. Okay? This is how brain disorders can change visual perception. Okay? Understood? Okay. Let's see. Okay. This is another guy. He's a Japanese guy. Mm -hmm. It's typical for Japanese guys. Huh? He's uh, trying to elucidate uh, which are the clues of visual perception. And in order to do this, he performed this type of paintings. Huh? That this is just B-dimensional. Mm -hmm. But the way in which it's painted gives you some four dimensions. Not only three dimensions, but also a sense of moving. Mm -hmm. So if you watch at this painting, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you can see, uh, this looks like something is moving. You can see this moving, or this is just quiet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is just in color, this is drawn in color, with a kind of 
in a way, with a technique that allows you to visualize some kind of sense of moving. Just think about how this is going to change if you just simply remove the colors. You took the same drawing, the same painting, and you just remove colors. This is just black and white. You're still feeling 3D. However, there's not so much, so many things that are moving. But this is the same painting. The only thing that has been removed is the information of colors. So every time you change something in what you are watching, your visual perception is about to change as well. Okay, okay this is one of, I'm not sure if you can appreciate it. This is a very famous painting, you all know, in Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. So uh, it has been even books in Britain trying to ascertain to what extent Mona Lisa is smiling or not smiling. And it's not that easy to, to look at it, and the illumination doesn't help, don't worry. Uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, wants to put yourself in this trouble by purpose. So he used a painting technique called esfumato. Esfumato is a painting technique that, for instance, for a number of boundaries, for a number of commissures, they became blurred, and they became blurred for purpose. So. Uh, it's not that easy to see here because of the, of the illumination, but the, you know, in order to adopt a final decision of to what extent Mona Lisa is smiling or not smiling, the only thing you need to do is to look at the, at the, at the face of the Mona Lisa. If you look at the eyes of the Mona Lisa, you may appreciate that the Mona Lisa is smiling. So just try to do the exercise. I, I, you know, I understand that the illumination doesn't help, but if you look at the eyes, you have the feeling that the Mona Lisa is smiling. Mm. However, if you look at the mouth of the Mona Lisa, the uh, Mona Lisa is not smiling at all. Mm. And this has been painted this way for this purpose. Mm. So Leonardo wants that the, you know, the people that are watching this such famous painting may retrieve two different sensations depending on the part of the, of, the, of the drawing you are, or the painting you are looking to, you may feel that Mona Lisa is smiling, or just the opposite sensation. Okay? I'm sorry, because the, you know, the, the illumination in the room doesn't help to, to, to see it very well. Okay, so now let's have some more fun. The first thing I, I really recommend to you is to go to the website of National Geographic, I look for a number of samples in a, in a, in a TV program called Brain Games. Brain Games are, you know, small videos that are uh, made by specialists, and most of them are made by neuroscientists, with a number of paradoxes that are very helpful when coming to explain how the brain works. Okay? And there are plenty of examples. I just came here with just one example because I don't want to take this in that long. But you know, uh, my, I, I strongly suggest you to go to Brain Games. You have a TV channel in Spanish, a TV channel in English, with plenty of examples in Brain Games that go to, to the browser. <coughs> and you will see a number of examples that are extremely helpful in uh, explaining how the brain works through a number of exercises. And I just came with one here. Let me switch the presentation to here. Okay. So here is something that you need to pay extra attention <coughs> to. I hope you can see. Well, I, let, let me explain. This is just a couple. Uh, uh, yeah? Can you switch off the lights? I think. Uh, but I'm not sure if we can record. Uh, just, just try to switch off the light. Is it possible to close? Yes. All. All of them. Yes. Now, yes. No. Please. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here you have, uh, but you need to pay a strong attention to what you are going to watch. Okay. I, I give you the context. This is just a couple, one man and one lady. They never saw each other for a long time, but you know, life is life. They managed to see each other again, so they went out for dinner, 
and they start a conversation that is absolutely trivial, absolutely futile. Uh, they speak about oh, how long we've been seeing each other, it looks very well, uh, it looks very well, uh, and that's it. And at the end, well, it's like a, a romantic dinner. So they are going to go through a number of plates. Uh, and at the end of the video, you will be requested to come out with the list of the menu. So you need to, uh, to memorize uh, which is the menu that he's about to, to eat, and which, the, which is the menu that she is about to eat. Okay? And pay attention to this. It's not that easy. Okay? But I guess that some of you, at the end, if you pay enough attention, will manage to see which is the menu they are going to, um, to, to, to take. Okay? Let's see. Es hora de poner a prueba otra vez su atención. Hemos organizado una escena con actores cenando en un restaurante. Solo tienen que fijarse en cuántas veces cambia la comida. Así que permanezcan atentos a los platos. No problem. ¿Listos para jugar? Empecemos. Ha pasado mucho tiempo. Pero tú estás igual. Sí. Estás todavía más guapa. Y tú todavía más encantador. Es como si nada hubiera cambiado. Me he divorciado. A veces tienes delante de la cara lo que buscas, pero no puedes verlo. Bésame, cariño. ¿Cuántos cambios han notado en sus platos? Vamos a rebobinar para verlo de nuevo. Ella empieza con una ensalada, que se transforma en una gran langosta, y luego, por arte de magia, en tarta de chocolate. La chuleta de cerdo de él se transforma en pollo con verduras, pero luego su plato aparece repentinamente vacío. Es posible que hayan notado esos cambios, pero ¿se han fijado en las otras 10 cosas que han cambiado delante de sus ojos? Puede que se hayan dado cuenta de algunas, pero seguro que han pasado por alto muchas otras. Mientras prestaban atención a los platos, nuestro especialista en engaño, Apollo Robbins, estaba cambiando el atrezo y el vestuario de los actores. Primero, ella llevaba una flor, luego ha cambiado de peinado. También ha perdido el collar y se ha cambiado de camiseta. Él ha cambiado de gafas y de corbata. Y también de jersey. Y las flores de al lado se han transformado un poco. Oh, ¿Y se han fijado en que le ha crecido pelo? Besa mi cariño. An example, and there we, we can switch on the lights now. Okay. Okay. This is just an example, yeah. and there are many, many more. Okay. And this is a very good example of what is doing now as focus attention. So, you, you know, I watch them now trying to confuse you a little bit because I, I just ask specifically to all of you to pay attention to the menu. So, the brain receives much more information at a given time that the amount of information that can be processed. Yeah. So the brain just, you know, it's just a matter of economy. The brain needs to simplify incoming information to get a readout. Okay. So you focus your attention on the menu, and you neglect everything that is, you know, going on around, just simply because you are focusing your attention on what I asked at the beginning. Okay, understood? So just in case you have some time and you want to go to this web page, there are plenty of many more examples that explain uh, how the brain works and how the brain makes mistakes just because of simplifying in you know, to accommodate the most useful information that is about to enter the brain in a given point or in a given time point. Okay? So, so this is the end of my talk. I want to be you know, as much provocative as I can. And now I'm quite pretty sure that you have plenty of questions, you have plenty of things in mind. And uh, you know, the, the final goal of this talk is that once you leave the room, you, know, you go back home you know, with some information that is, some ideas about the brain that are, might be completely different from the other ideas you have the brain at the time you came into the room. Okay? But you know, now it's time for you to make <coughs> questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to go ahead. Okay. So go ahead with 
don't, don't be afraid to, to raise your hand and to ask questions. You may ask a question and don't have a real reply, but you know, this can be just an open dialogue or whatever. So, you know, my, my first question to all of you. Now you think of the brain in a different way than before. You get surprised by how the brain works. Well, that's, that's the main goal of the talk, and, and just to give you some more, you know, more clues or more, say, provocative thinking about how the brain works. Because probably you never thought about this before. All of, the, all of these things about the brain have, have a kind of relationship with, the, for example, the sun that uh, people say, for example, that have uh, two ways, like, Sometimes you hear a word and others another. And for example, if you read that someone heard like, uh, like in a way, then you heard always in the way that the, they have to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, for instance, uh, this is true. Uh, so, I mean, the final perception is something that is uh, individual dependent. So two individuals hearing something or watching something may came up with a different perception, that, that's for sure. Another, another example is a, a, a disorder, is probably a disease, that is dyslexia. So people that are not so much fluent in Spanish, for example, they have some difficulties in speaking in a, in a fluent way. And this can be painted by a logoped, and at the end, you know, these guys can, can speak in a, in a fluent basis. However, uh, you might be dyslexic in different languages. So perhaps you can correct your dyslexia in Spanish, but once you start learning English, you became dyslexic again. Mm -hmm. And this is typical for many, many people that are dyslexic. One of my PhD students uh, some years ago was dyslexic. So he went to the double pen to, you know, to, to, be able to correct this, this disorder in, in, in speaking. He managed to do it quite well. Once he finished his PhD thesis, he went abroad to the US, so he had to speak in English. And he got started with the same problem again at the beginning. Because uh, you can be corrected, uh, you can be speaking in Spanish, so you are no longer dyslexic, because this can be corrected by treatment. However, when you start speaking in a foreign language, you became dyslexic again, so you have to start from the beginning. Okay? More questions? Okay, so it was a real pleasure to me to be here today speaking in front of you. Uh, I hope you have a, a pleasant time and you have a, a joy. It's, it's, it's not a pure scientific talk, but you know, it's something you know, I have prepared in an attempt to illustrate you some ideas or some basic things about how the brain works. Okay, so thanks a lot for coming. Um, Thank you very much.